Hello everyone and welcome to In Practopia, the People, Places, Things Caribbean show. Kim Jo here with you and to bring you another great In Practopia show. And of course, In Practopia is being made possible by continued listeners like you. On the show, we have Miss Nalo Hopkinson. She's a published and prize-winning author. A wonderful chat about how she got into writing and what she has planned for the future. Also on the show, we have Did You Know? Caribbean and West Indian Literature. Along with our Ode to the Caribbean quote, and we'll end the show with the announcement of next week's guest. Again, welcome to this week's In Practopia. Let's get the show on the road. Oh, yeah. It's time now for Did You Know? Caribbean and West Indian Literature. Caribbean literature is the term generally accepted for the literature of the various territories of the Caribbean region. Literature in English, specifically from the former British West Indies, may be referred to as Anglo-Caribbean or in historical context, West Indian literature. The term West Indies first began to achieve wide currency in the 1950s when writers such as Samuel Sevlon, John Hearn, Edgar Middlehostel, V.S. Naipaul, and John Lamming began to be published in the United Kingdom. A sense of a single literature developing across the islands was also encouraged in the 1940s by the BBC radio program Caribbean Voices, which featured stories and poems written by West Indian authors recorded in London under the direction of producer Henry Swansea and broadcast back to the islands. West Indian literature ranges over subjects and themes as wide as those of any other national literature, but in general, many West Indian writers share special concern with questions of identity, ethnicity, and language that rise out of the Caribbean historical experience. That was a great bit of knowledge, I should say, about Caribbean and West Indian literature. A great intro to my guest, Miss Nala Hopkinson, who is a science fiction and fantasy novel writer. I had a wonderful conversation with her. I learned so much. And just her jovial cheerfulness will keep you hanging on until the end. I write science fiction and fantasy. Um, I write it because it's what I've always read, even from, you know, from small is what I was reading. Um, and the thing is, even though we might not think of ourselves as, uh, or, or this is being a genre that is natural to us, um, a lot of our writers write um, some form of the literature of the fantastic, so magical realism, or you no know, duppy stories, or, um, and we live like the rest of the world. We live in the 21st century. We live. A lot of people have said that the future is now. So it's a very natural progression, living a, living a life as a, as a Caribbean person and having to um, be as flexible as we are. We have such a huge diaspora of people living all over the world. We've had this experience of being colonized over and over again and then claiming our, our spaces for ourselves. That is the story of science fiction. So uh, the, I think the thing that intimidates people is that they think the word science but that's what libraries are for. So. Yeah. You know, when I, I read your, one of the, the first book of yours I read was Brown Girl in the Ring. And it made me smile over and over because there was so, there was, even when you put in some of the Patois, which was kind of Jamaican, it mm-hmm. sounded like St. Lucia and even some of the words, the terms in there. I yes. was, I was in this perfect state throughout the book, yes. but what came to my mind, I was thinking of a, a genre, something that I termed was more folkloric fantasy because uh-huh. of all of the, you know, like you mentioned, the, the doppy, the, the things, the supernaturalistic aspect of it that came with us from Africa. So yeah. that was the term that stuck with me. But, you know, it was just a joy for me to be able to read that one book of yours and then look forward to reading more of your other works. Thank you. And um, I mean, I quoted uh, famous St. Lucian Derek Walcott a few times mm-hmm. in there. 
I had to get his permission, in fact, and he was he was quite wonderful about it. But yes, I mean, we live surrounded by technology, so it's very natural to tell the stories that we tell anyway. The 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 duppies and the jumpies and the those are part of our belief systems, and everybody around the world has those. So it's just a matter of kind of translating uh, and getting yourself in that way of thinking that you are surrounded. You are living in a science fiction world. You are surrounded by it, and you're surrounded by the 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 belief systems and the stories that come out of our our beliefs. So it's the real world. Yeah. Now you said you grew up reading fantasy and science fiction. But what's your backstory and how you became a writer? Were you writing from a young age? What was your what What's your story? I was not writing from a young age, but I was surrounded by books and literature of various kinds because my father was a writer. Slade Hopkinson, he was a poet and a playwright and an actor, and he taught English and Latin at the sixth form level. My mother is a library technician. She she catalogs books. So there were books everywhere. I lived in a household full of books. The The stuff my father was teaching, as well as folk tales and from all over the world and so my parents gave me free reign at the bookshelves and sometimes the books were um, quite adult I mean there would have been sex scenes in some of them and that kind of thing but when you're a kid you just kind of gloss over that that is big people stuff you want to know about the monsters so (laughs) 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 you figure you had time for that (laughs) you know whatever it was yeah so that didn't stop me and so I was reading things like some of the, the sort of classics, that you, the, the, the European classics you get taught, like the Homer's Iliad. And, but I was also reading Miss Lou, Louise Bennett Coberly, uh, Jamaican poet and storyteller. Mm-hmm. I was reading Kamal Brathwaite. I was reading. So I kept doing that. And it wasn't until I was in my mid-30s that um, I began to want to write it or that I began to feel it was possible and by then we were living in Toronto, Canada, and I was able to find a, a writing workshop that then turned into a, a sort of a, a almost like a salon where the three of us would meet every two weeks and share our work and critique it. And that's basically how I got started. From there, I took a six-week workshop specifically for science fiction and fantasy. It's called Clarion. There's one in Seattle. I'll be teaching at it next year. There's one in San Diego. And for a while, there was one in Brisbane, Australia. Live on campus for six weeks. You have to apply. Mm -hmm. If you get accepted, you live on campus for six weeks with usually about 17 other students. And every week, there's a different writer in residence. So I came out of that having met people in the industry Having you know spent six weeks with with a cohort of people who were all interested in writing what I write, and from there started submitting my work and getting it published. Not too long after that, I had written a novel and I submitted it. No, I got that backwards. <laughs> I submitted it to the Warner Aspect First Novel Contest. I had not written a novel; I had written two chapters, right? Yeah. So they said they wrote and said, "All right, we've shortlisted you. Send us the novel now." <laughs> wow. So then I had to write a novel. <laughs> because I was going to get on to what about what you know about your level of confidence in even writing a whole book. Writing one or two chapters is is a feat and then writing a whole book. Well if I have if there's anything I have to tell people is don't wait till you're confident. Because okay. you're never going to be confident. I didn't know what I was doing. I did not know what the rass I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> I just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote in a dead heat of panic and then one day I couldn't figure out what to write at all at all at all and I looked back through the story and realized that was because I had tied up all the plot threads so I was done so even that I was finished was a surprise to me your your brain will throw up roadblocks all the time it will tell you you're not good enough it will tell you there's so many books in the world who is you to go write another one Mm -hmm. it's all nonsense think of it as the kind of you know, you know, you, you drive into the street, there's garbage in the streets, but the road will still take you where you're going. Ignore the garbage. Just write. You know what? I just recently, you know, some friends and I, we went to uh, this person was launching his book and he's a celebrity. And she said that the writing world is such that nowadays the only people who can publish are celebrities. What's your thought on that? Well, if you sit and think through that for a few minutes, you realize it don't make no sense because... How you get to be a celebrity? You don't always wake up one morning and somebody 
you know, <laughs> says Stubbs, you're a celebrity. You get there by writing. When I started out, I didn't know anybody. I mean, I knew the people in the Caribbean writing community because of my father, but I didn't know anybody in the science fiction community. Uh, I did what everybody else does. I I made connections. I, I, I took workshops. I went to the events. I went to the readings. But it's not who you know. Publisher don't want to publish you because of who you are. That's not going to sell the books unless you're really, really famous and, you know, have had some kind of sex scandal. <laughs> <laughs> What's going to sell the books is the writing. Yeah. So that's just another roadblock that people throw up. And I hear people saying over and over again, you can't break in nowadays. It's who you know. It is nonsense. Wow. So talk to me about who were your influencers. I know you did the workshop, but were there people that you looked up to, their style of writing that you maybe wanted to pattern after, but people who were big in your mind as people that you that, that the writing quality was right up there and you wanted to, to mimic or follow or be in that same league with? Mm-hmm. And one, I, part of the reason I went to that particular clarion was because one of them was going to be one of the instructors. And his name is Samuel R. Delaney. I had admired his work from way back. He was one of the first known black science fiction writers and the depth and complexity of his work had always, and the fearlessness of it, because eh? whatever comes to his mind, he sees it as fair game to tackle. And so part of the reason I was I uh, glad to get into that particular clarion was because he would be there. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the Caribbean writers, because I had grown up with my father's friends being writers from the Caribbean, and my father being a writer from the Caribbean. So that sense of language and storytelling, the, the, the notion of the man of words, mm-hmm. you know, that very much influences how I write. Uh, the, the, the words have to flow uh, and they have to have that kind of, that kind of juiciness that we bring to this, this, our experience of the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, so people like my father, people like Pamela Mordecai, people like Kamal Brathwaite, Derek Walcott, uh, were all the, the, just the sheer beauty and and the fearlessness of their language very much stays with me and of course all the science fiction writers i was reading a lot of the feminist writers a lot of the queer writers when i started finding writers of color i actually went and looked for them because you can't always tell yeah um so there are just so many that if i start giving you examples i will never stop there's a man in um canada in nova scotia uh, another black writer he writes fantasy his name is Charles Saunders. So he was another one of the sort of touchstones, one of the people sort of who went before me. A woman named Nisi Shaw. I actually published novels before she did, but she was writing short stories. A black woman from the American South, originally living in Seattle now. And her work just makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean when you read somebody that just makes you happy. <laughs> yes, yes. My friend Kelly Link, she wasn't somebody I knew about before I attended Clarion because she and I went to Clarion together. But hers was the first short story I read at Clarion and it blew me away. I did not know how she had done it. So I started studying and she's one of my fellow students. Mm-hmm. And um, now she's she's got on to win a number of awards. She's published a number of short story collections She started her own publishing house and is publishing award-winning books by other writers. Uh, And so always her. I I could go on for a very long time. But you're an award-winning author too. So, you know, I salute you for that. (laughs) (laughs) Trying to be modest, you've done some good stuff too. But I wanted to get at Nalo because I've been reading a lot of Caribbean writing now. And I wanted to get at how, how do publishers react? Do they encourage you to put a lot of the dialect and the slang in the writing because I know if we had to go real, real local, even some of the interpretations or the translations might be difficult for people outside of the region or people who don't know the local language to, to interpret. Mm-hmm. But bear in mind that people like Samuel Selvon were doing it long ago. Mm-hmm. So there's another roadblock you can't put in your own way. Like, Don't worry about is the publisher going to like it or understand it. Find a publisher who does. And also, always, always, always work on your own writing first. Uh, Because often people will say those kinds of things because they haven't worked on their own writing, so they come up with other reasons. It's not to say those barriers are not there. Of course there are. There's racism, there's classism, there's, you know, all of that stuff is there. 
Uh, there is, there's even, you know, the, the who you know thing does happen. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying there are ways that you can sidestep it. Okay. Uh, and the best way is to work on your writing mm-hmm. and to not be shy to put it out there. So when I first submitted a story, when I first submitted a story to the Warner Aspect First Novel Contest, and, and you read it, it mm-hmm. starts in Creole. Yes. Um, and it often has whole sections written in Creole and has mm-hmm. quotations from Derek Walcott's Tijan and his brothers. But what I had had come in before me was the Miss Lou's, the Kamal Brathwaite's, the Samuel Salvons. So I looked at my own writing in Caribbean vernacular Mm-hmm. I tried to work out how to put it on the page yeah. so that people at least know what the words were. Right. So for the most part, I, I spell the words in conventional spelling, but I keep the rhythm and the, 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 the words that are, that are um, portmanteau words from other languages, I keep them there. Mm-hmm. So if a Jamaican is going to say bunanonos, that goes on the page, yes. right? And people can cope. I mean, they read in, you know, they read in train spotting and they read in, they can mm-hmm. cope with, 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 with Caribbean language. Yeah. So what I did not know when I first submitted to Warner Aspect is that the, the editor who saw my work is a white woman from New York, but her husband is a black man in the theater. Mm-hmm. So when she phoned me to tell me I had won the contest, she said, I want to ask you something. I said, what? She said, are you black? I said, yes. She said, oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she didn't know any of the, very much of the culture or the language, but she could make sense of what I had written. Mm-hmm. The, I had no, I had very, I've had very little trouble. I mean, there are editors who won't publish me. There are readers who find it too difficult to keep going. Mm-hmm. They are not my audience. The world is full of people who read. It's full of editors. Yes. Um, so that's what I try to do is find. And I do have, at the copy editing stage, because I'm primarily publishing in North America, I will get queries from the copy editor. And the copy editor is different from the editor. Right? The copy editor is looking at it line by line and trying to make sure that if somebody has brown eyes on page one, they don't have green eyes on page 22. Right. So I, they, they will put my language because they're used to black American vernacular. So they have to check. If they're not sure, they have to check. So they will say, you know, did you mean to say it this way? Isn't it this how this is said? Which is hilarious because often the copy editors are white. Um, so they don't really know anyway. But you always have the power to say no. Yes. Like don't be so, so you know, craven wanting to get published that you, you try to give in. So I can always say, no, I want it to stay like this. And if I feel like explaining to reassure them, uh, I'll say, this is Caribbean English. Okay. And they leave it. How many they fight me on the spelling. Because <laughs> they want to spell it the American way. And I'm like, no, put the U in color. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> I try to stick with the, the British thing in me as much as possible. Yes, please mm-hmm. put the U in color. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, now, how many books have you written? And is there one or two that... Um, is more special or more dear. I know everyone has its own its own journey, but I have lost track. <laughs> it's because it's a lot. It's well, it's lot. it's not a lot compared to to some of in, in science fiction and fantasy. It's not unusual for people to publish a book a year. I can't do that. Mm-hmm. So by those standards, I am not very published. But by everybody else's standards, I am. <laughs> So Brown Girl in the Ring, Midnight Robber, Skin Folk, Salt Roads, New Moon's Arms, The Chaos, Sister Mine, Report from Planet Midnight, which is a chat book. So there's, there's another one, a short story collection coming out next summer. Okay. So nine and a number of short stories. Short and stories, yeah. Yeah, and journals all over the place. So, so nine. I one or two that... that that stick out in terms of, I don't know, if there was some emotional, whatever was going, which one or two that, that really is up there for you in terms of the process. The thing is, when you're working on one, it's your favorite. Mm-hmm. It's also the one you hate the most. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's different for different people, but for me, writing is not easy. The process is, is hard work. I have a couple of learning disorders that make it hard to sit down and stick with something. Mm-hmm. 
So it's not the writing, writing. It's the, oh, God, I have to do this again. I, I did it yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't do that very well at all. Sometimes weeks go by. So, but when we are working on something, that's what's obsessing you. Mm -hmm. And when you get done and it's, it's all shiny and new, that's your new baby. Right. But as time goes on, it gets harder and harder to say this is my favorite or that is my favorite because each one is so different. So, so I, I, I put them on the shelf in my office and, and they're like, my babies are my children. I'm not going to say you're my favorite and you're my favorite. I'll say, you know, I like you better for doing this and I like you better for doing that. But I like that answer. I really do. I think we can leave it right there. Yeah, we don't want the kids to feel one feeling like I'm the middle child, one feeling more loved or less loved. We we'll leave it right there. Exactly. You put the same sweat and tears into all of them. Yes. You had told me there are a few... Uh, Caribbean writers who write under the science fiction fantasy banner. Can you pull out a few of them for us? Mm -hmm. uh, Tobias Bukel from St. Thomas. Uh -huh. Karen Lord, who lives in Barbados. Ibi Anu, who is from Haiti. His work is harder to find now because he switched into documentary film, but Claude Michel Prevost, uh, who's also from Haiti. Karen Loachi, who's from Canada like me. She's, I think, second-generation Caribbean, so, so her roots go back to Guyana. I'm sure there are others that I am skipping. It's, it's getting to be that they're more of a snob. It doesn't mean there's a lot. Mm -hmm. And there are writers in Trinidad, um, Michael Anthony, Lisa Allen, I think her surname is. She's also a, a reviewer and a wonderful reviewer. So you mentioned that you have a publication coming out next year, but what are you doing right now? I was working on a novel called Black Art Man that is an alternate history with fantasy elements. And I've gotten it about 70% done and I'm stuck. There's something I don't quite have the hand, a handle on it yet. Um, and then last spring, I went to um, the Nebula Award Ceremonies. The Nebula is um, a science fiction fantasy award given out uh, it's voted on by members of uh, Science Fiction Writers of America, which is a, um, a, a writer's professional organization that anybody with the right number of publications can join anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, to my surprise, I won the, the Andre Norton Award for Young Adult Fiction oh. for, in my mind, an extremely not young adult novel. <laughs> I don't, I don't suppose young adults would complain, but their parents might if they read it. Well, but, based on what we see passing as young adult reading and how they translated it to the screen, I'm sure they were right in saying that yours is young adult. I'm not going to argue with anybody giving me a beautiful award. So. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and in fact, the protagonist, although she was, you know, a full grown hardback woman, uh -huh. uh, she was just setting out on her life on her own. So in many ways, the themes are very similar to young adult. And something about winning that award that I did not expect to take home at, at all kind of galvanized me. So I'm working on a new novel now. It's also an alternate history of the Caribbean set in 19th century. I haven't decided if it will be Jamaica or if it will be a place that sort of looks like Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Writing is going quite slowly for me nowadays. It's always been hard to like churn out those pages. And now I'm lucky if I can churn out sentences. Um, but, you know, you put enough sentences together and you'll get a novel. Yeah. So yeah. I keep writing. <laughs> so that's what I'm working on. Any chance that you'd be writing, like, a sequence of one book? Mm -hmm. I know, like a series. Yes. Um, a thing happens to me when I'm, when I'm, you know, between the traces of a novel that's due and, and all the panic is setting in. I always get this brilliant idea that what I really need to do is write a sequel. Mm -hmm. and so far, my editors have said no, and so far they have been right because it's just panic talking. I want to do anything but work on this book. Right? Yes. <laughs> um, I don't know if I if I have enough of a an interest to sustain a sequel. A novel is a huge stretch for me. When I'm done, I am done. Um, so I'm I don't know that I will. I tend to think in a, a, a novel length story arc or a short story arc. So where can somebody find your find your books if they wanted to buy? I bought my books on Amazon. So I'm not using Amazon, but I don't mind however people get my books. Mm -hmm. You can order directly from the publisher. You can go to your local bookstore and ask them to order them and they will do that.
How about Miss Nalo Hopkinson? Her books, I must say, are a worthy read. It's going to take you to a place where it's going to have you in a totally happy state. And they're just worth your time. I should say that her books are not available on Amazon because of Amazon's ebook pricing policy. There are some differences there. So like she said, you can always get them at any bookstore. If they're not on the shelf, ask them to be ordered and you will get a book written by Nalo Hopkinson. This episode's Ode to the Caribbean quote comes from novelist Jamaica Kincaid, and she says, I come from a little island with the Caribbean Sea on one side and the Atlantic Ocean on the other. I come from really nowhere, and for me, the fiction and the non-fiction, creative or otherwise, all come from the same place. Thank you very much, Miss Kincaid. Well, that's our show for this week. Next week, we will be talking about jump rope clubs in the Caribbean. So I hope you come around for that. In Practopia is available for download on Stitcher and iTunes. You can also listen to the show on the website and I invite you to give us a star ratings and also write, uh, send us some comments, write your comments. I can't say it enough and we'll also have the opportunity to read them on the show. So do that. Talk to your friends about In Practopia and I'll be right here next time in Practopia. Yeah.